Okay, here goes. Been trying to get this bloke on for a little while. Trying to get a lot of Kiwis on, and they're always very obliging, uh, very helpful there. Willie Nichols, the media manager, has been very helpful right. uh, with that. And uh, Will Somerville tipped me off to this one. So Will show. Somerville's Will got nothing to do with yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The entire apparatus, you know, yes. it's true to form with the Kiwis. Um, here's some numbers for you. 48 tests, 206 wickets at 26, 9 fifers, best bowling of 7 for 39. 43 wickets in 2019 at 17.8. 722 first-class wickets in 170-odd matches. Uh, he goes, it's the man who frightened us, our nation, mm. last summer, Neil Wagner. Neil, welcome to the Great Cricketer. G'day, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, welcome. That's a sharp start from Neil. Okay, let's, just, let's rock straight into this with a key question, Neil. Like, I, I want to hop straight into it. You know, un- uh, until you arrived last year, it was thought that the only way for seamers to succeed in Australia was to bowl at 145 kilometres an hour plus regularly, <laughs> 150 preferable. Mm. Uh, it was the only way to take wickets. It's the only way to be respected socially, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise. <laughs> Turns out it's not the secret at all. Turns out the secret is just bumping blokes. Yep. How happy are you to have been the person to unlock the blueprint for dismantling Steve Smith? in Australian society? Yeah, I wouldn't go as far. Um, <laughs> uh, to come back to your pace question, uh, yeah, I fell underneath that trap quite a bit, uh, to be fair, and um, I think as a cricketer, yeah, the speed gun sort of kills swing a little bit at times, and uh, and also you know, I can do with skill, but, you know, you guys got some pretty skillful bowlers that can do it at a, at a pretty decent flick, but um, for sure, fellas like myself, I think you sometimes get carried away uh, with time to bowl too quick um, and looking at the speed gun, and I sort of, with time as your career goes on and you get a bit of experience, you sort of seem to put that away a little bit, not worry about that or too fast, but just with consistency of length, even if it is either, either a short ball or bounce or if it is uh, top of the stump sort of stuff, the ball swinging, um, to be consistent, I guess, is what gets you in the game. And, um, and obviously having a little bit of a point of difference, something different in there, uh, which has obviously been... Being the short stuff for me, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can sometimes look away and just try and bowl 150, and and that's it. But um, there's been some phenomenal bowlers around the world who's been uh, obviously um, pretty good skill-wise, uh, not bowling that pace and still have pretty good numbers. But yeah, if you look at your big boys that you have on that side, it is pretty frightening when you can put all that together and bowl 150 k an hour. Um, that is yeah, pretty lethal. But the, I guess the big question is. is how long you can do it for because it's pretty tough to roll that place, especially in that heat. Mm. Um, if you're going in for 10 over spells or for, you know, 10, 20 overs plus in a day, which uh, the Aussies are bloody smart and kept us in the field for a long period of time. And I think we bowled about 35 overs in the plus. So um, that did, yeah, make the workload a bit heavier. Mm. We'll come back to the delineation between uh, the short ball and the bouncer. Mm. And, um, big yep. and big boys. And big boys. But uh, I want to go right back to the beginning of your story. And, you know, we, we speak a lot about here in the great cricket about alpha life. And there's perhaps no bigger alpha than Faf Duplessis, which I understand, Neil, um, that you went to school with Neil back in Pretoria. So I need to know, you know, was Faf always the king alpha? Was his rig always impeccable? You know, what was Faf like back in those days? <laughs> Well, there was not a he out of place. <laughs> yeah, on the chair. <laughs> uh, his shirts, his shirts were always uh, extra small and made sure they're very tight. And um, <laughs> yeah, he definitely looked the bit. Uh, so what you see from there is exactly the way he was when he was 13 years old as well. So um, nothing has changed there, to be fair. And his rig has always been immaculate. He was one of those guys who who liked being uh, at the swimming pool without a shirt on and being able to show his muscles. So. Key point to him, he's always looked after really well. <laughs> around, the, around the same time when you were a, a, a junior, Neil, it emerges that uh, there's, there's a story from Glenn McGrath's Cricket World Cup diary in 2003 in South Africa yep. um, when he picks out, just in his, in his book, he just says there was a great bowl in the nets. His name's William oh, yeah. Wagner. The spelling yeah. is all over the shop. But, so <laughs> you, um, That's on brain. You would have been 16 at the time. He, he picks you out as one to look, look out for in the future. And we're talking about alpha life. I mean, what did you learn that day about Australian alpha life in the nets with Dizzy, you know, whoever else, Andy Bickle, Glenn? McGrath? Yeah, I think um, I was 17 years old and and I think my persona what my experience was growing up in South Africa was looked at Australians and you thought they arrogant and cocky and you know, know all sort of guys, it was sort of what you brought up to sort of perceive of them and look at them and, and know they're big dogs and the thing that I think struck me the most was the guys were very down to earth, they were very polite, very nice and sort of walked in there and I was quite shy and didn't really want to say much but uh, Brett Lee, uh, you know, uh, Jason Gillespie, uh, um, Glenn McGrath was, and Andy Bickle was amazing. The way they approached us, the amount of time they put into us in the nets and, and trained with us was, was unbelievable. And, and these are the sort of guys you look up to and you sort of 
quite scared because, like I said, I thought they, you know, going to be a little bit more arrogant and quite, you know, big about himself, but they wasn't. It was literally the exact opposite. And the thing that stood out for me the most was that Clem McGrath and Bradley actually picked my bag up and walked it to my parents' car uh, as my parents came and, you know, picked me up and dropped me off at this training. And, and they walked it all the way to my parents' car, had a yarn with my mom and dad, and sort of, you know, McGrath, the tall man he is, was sort of leaning on this small little car's roof and yarning to my parents. And, and the bus was waiting for them. Um and and they made the bus late while they were talking to my folks, and I thought that was pretty awesome. And I think the thing that stood out the most was a, a couple of years down the track, I think uh, it's quite a few years later, um, probably about six or seven years later, Bradley played for Wellington in a T20 game against Otago when I played for Otago in Queenstown. And I saw Bradley then, and he remembered exactly who I was and asked me about the shift to New Zealand and everything and remembered the day to it at all, um, exactly. So I, I looked at him, I was a little bit starstruck and a bit stunned and sort of looked at him, I thought, that's pretty special, you know, that takes a, a serious character to be able to, to remember a kid like that and, and come in and ask and say, you know, pretty awesome to see that mm. you followed out your career and your dreams and, and stuff like that. And, um, and yeah, I mean, just the, the, you know, the knowledge and the experience that they had at that time to be able to, to learn a little bit out of the needs from them, um, was huge. So at the moment that I remember for the rest of my life, and, and I know, you know, thinking about kids today um, and how you want to be, I guess, perceived as a kid and, and what you want to give to a kid is, is, is literally trying to aspire to do exactly what they did because I know how big a, I guess, impact that had on my life. Um, and for him to write about it in his diary, which I never knew until I yeah, caught up about yeah, a couple of months ago when we played that uh, Sydney Test for the Melbourne team talking to him in the middle and then someone got hold of it um, in the media and tweeted me that. Um, I did not know about it, so I thought it was, uh, it was pretty special as well. Mm. You've obviously played all over the world, Neil, and, and you obviously started in South African provincial cricket there. I mean, how different is South African provincial cricket to, say, domestic cricket in New Zealand? I, I imagine, you know, that level of um, South African cricket. I know you played against Dean Elgar uh, in test matches, and you obviously played him against him uh, in, in uh, South African provincial cricket as well. I mean, is, is it ultra-aggressive, those kind of matches? I, I envisage, like, South African domestic cricket to be super sledgy and, like, high-octane, whereas New Zealand's just a whole bunch of nice guys. It, it sort of was a little bit, but depending, I guess, who you played, it was sort of always the rivalries, as well as the sort of neighbouring teams. It was um, it always had a little bit more heat on it, um, mm. and it was a little bit more going around it, but other teams wasn't too much. So, to be fair, it wasn't too dissimilar from what we experienced in New Zealand. Um, I thought, you know, New Zealand's going to be a lot more relaxed, and it is a bit more relaxed, but there was the odd, you know, similarities around it as well, I guess, especially in first-class cricket. So, mm. um, yeah, I, I think... Um, to be fair, uh, you know, at that time I played um, cricket, South African cricket was in a very, very strong position where they was. I mean, just the amount of bowlers that was lining up in the queue and the guys who were playing, um, it was pretty tough to crack a side at that stage. Um, it was just with the talent going around and, and coming to New Zealand, it was sort of, you sort of like back against the wall again. There was quite a bit of talent around coming through the ranks, um, especially young guys coming in. So you sort of felt like, you know, he was continuously sort of knocking on the door and having to fight really hard and work really hard. And I guess um, coming from that bank, background of South Africa sort of helped me when I came in here that it wasn't really like I was just trying to ease into things and, and just trying to find my way. It was mm. sort of really having to fight to your spot and put your hand up and, and show that you wanted to play and, and be here. When you uh, when you moved to New Zealand, um, I, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about a game specifically, 2011, Otago versus, who were you playing? You playing Wellington. You took four wickets in four balls, so a double hat-trick, and then you took a fifth wicket in the sixth ball of the over, which is the first time it's ever happened in first-class cricket history. At that point, were you thinking, well, I'm probably about five minutes away from the test team here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, not really, to be fair. Um, uh, the only thing I was thinking was getting off the bloody field because it was bloody freezing. Um so we were playing in Queenstown. Mm. <laughs> we were playing in Queenstown, and there was obviously a bit of fresh snow on the on the remarkables right on the mountains, and the breeze was just coming nicely off that too. So um, I think uh, the game was quite dead and dull, and there was no wickets happening. And sort of went through a period we thought, "Oh, we're going to be you know in the park for a long time there." And um, yeah, as soon as those wickets happened, I think the hand warmers were out there and stuff like that, and mm. people were just be happy to get off the off the park to be fair. But um, yeah, I mean, in that time, we're sort of getting closer to the point where I was going to qualify and um, and be able to become eligible to play for New Zealand. And I didn't really ever think that, you know, I had a foot in the door or anything like that. I sort of felt like you had to work really hard, and especially being someone coming from another country, um, you had to sort of, you know, um, 
you, you always, well, I guess when you start coming, you feel like you have to prove something, and it's the worst thing you can think about. But that's how you feel when, you, especially when you're young, you sort of feel like you've got to prove something and and be something, you know. Um, and then you can sort of sometimes, I guess, fall in a bit of a trap and and try too hard. But um, yeah, I guess looking back at it, it was sort of, you know. Um, didn't really expect anything like that. Just wanted to keep working hard and mm. and show that I wanted to play and that I try, you know, believe that I belonged um, in some sort of way. But uh, yeah, I, it was obviously the start of something. It was a pretty special day that and, and, and something that I guess will stick to the memory box for a very long time. No, oh, game's dead. Get wags on. Get yeah. wags on. Yeah. How many? So you got five <laughs> wickets in an over. I mean, how many of those were pitched up at the stumps? So you actually did did one slip out and pitch one up. <laughs> to be fair, mate, that was when I was back in the day swinging the ball and didn't really well that many bumpers. <laughs> it, was, um, <laughs> it was actually reversing quite a bit. It was a brace of surface and, and a reverse, so everything was quite full in Yorkers and it stumps. Mm-hmm. I sort of, at that stage of my, uh, I guess my career was the exact opposite. I was known for bowling Yorkers and not bouncers, mm-hmm. so um, things have changed a lot for, <laughs> since then. So, um, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a switch around and yeah, you've got to do what you got to do to try and obviously um, yeah, make your mark and be successful, I guess. Still had two leg gullies in, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was nothing. It was two gullies, normal gullies, though. But, yeah. No, you know the exact if, if, I, if, I, if I knew back then what I know now, I probably would have had something. <laughs> Let's talk about it now, Neil. Uh, you know, 43 wickets of 17.8 last year. Uh, you know, we often talk on the show about the smug enjoyment the batsmen feel when making 100 in a losing side. Mm. Uh, you know, head back to the change room. You know, you know, you did your job. Um, <laughs> Nobody else did, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, how, how satisfying was last summer's tour to Australia on that level uh, for you as a bowler? It wasn't very satisfying at all. To be lies, lies, um, lies, lies, it, lies. It, it, it was quite uh, it was quite tough to be honest. It was a little bit bittersweet. Yeah, it's nice to uh, get some performances on the ball personally, and, and I just try and contribute and do my best for the side. But I guess the uh, the dull side of it is I'd rather take an unfair and walk off the field than know we've been in Australia no, at a no, boxing day no, test match. No. I don't believe I you. can give you that for sure. No, don't believe <laughs> I'll put uh, I'll put a lot of beers on it. I'll give you that. Beers. <laughs> 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 um, I remember that um, beers in ages. Yeah. yeah, it's sort of um, yeah, it's sort of a bit of a dull moment to be fair. Yeah, you, you know, you're walking off and you're being completely outplayed, and to be honest, being bossed around a little bit. Um, I think it's one of the hardest things about touring Australia is that when you're on the back foot, you sort of Having yeah uh, to create something and you sort of you know behind the eight ball a little bit. It is a tough place to to obviously come back and, and put Australia under pressure. They're that good in their own conditions that you know when you sort of behind from the start um, and things go against you, uh, you always feel like you're playing a bit of catch up. You sort of know you've got to strike early and you've got to be on top of them. And there's a lot of things you've got to go your way with obvious tosses and conditions. And and um, once Australia gets uh, the foot on the throttle, they uh, they don't really go. Um, so that was a pretty tough series for us personally, especially with some high expectations from people back home and even with us personally that we wanted to obviously uh, play really well and wanted to win that series and, and, and perform against a quality team. And, um, yeah, it was quite a disappointing tour for us, you know, um, in that sense. So uh, the personal sort of side of things, it, it sort of feels like it's sort of then, you know, down the down low for me. It's just to to contribute in whatever way I can for us to win games. And uh, I guess, like I said, if you take a Fifa and you're losing a test match, it, it doesn't really feel uh, as good. And taking a Fifa and winning a test match is a pretty special feeling. Um, but, yeah, I guess that is just the way cricket goes. Yeah, well, uh, it's all good. We all have to say what we need to say in public. <laughs> you know, that's fine. That's uh, all you said off Well, let's, 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 uh, let's speak about you on a purely personal level and keep the team yeah. out of it, if that's possible. Yeah. I mean... Steve Smith was so difficult to get out for the Englishman. It's been, it's been difficult to get out for pretty much every country. Like, how satisfying is it for you for the rest of your life whenever Steve Smith goes on to make more runs, which he will because that's all he knows how to do, <laughs> you'll be able to sit at home having a barbie and purely out the side of your mouth just say, you just got to bump this blood. <laughs> <laughs> Very satisfying if I'm not going to lie. There we go. Now we go. Only to the point that he is, um, he is an absolute freak. He's a cricket nuffy. Um, he is exceptional talent. And I remember from the first time I played him where he was only just a, a leg spinner and bending down the order. Um, he already showed the traits that he was a, a fighter and just one of those guys that was just lately. He just looked like he couldn't bat, but he just bat and mm. just kept scoring runs and it was frustrating. And um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, when you that good and one of the world's best, that's where you, you want to stand up against those sort of guys and try and get him out and you want to compete against those sort of guys. And, and for me, lucky it came off and had a bit of a plan to him and, and that plan sort of happened and uh, I guess Brent McCullum's last test in 2015-16, I think, at Christchurch, where he 
pretty much slapped us all around the ground and I think he got 130 or 150 odd um, and yeah, scored all over the ground and got towards the later half of the innings we just went, nah, screw that, let's just bump the guy and um, <laughs> found, found a little something there to be fair, that's where he first got out in that sort of fashion that way and um, yeah, then obviously in the World Cup to Lockie he got out similar sort of way pulling like that and I sort of felt that there's still something that hasn't really changed and it's maybe a point to try and attack him in that sort of way and um, yeah obviously tried swinging the ball first and pitch it up and that's probably not the way to go to Steve Smith because he just scores in, in very weird areas and he scores a lot of runs so you want to try and, and dry a guy like that up and, and make it hard for him because yeah, uh, yeah it's just making something different I guess and um, yeah luckily it came off Um he showed extreme resilience and, and a lot of patience with it. I think, you know, especially in the Melbourne Chiefs, he, he wore a lot on the body and he kept ducking and, you know, swaying through a few of them, um, which is full credit to him because I would have been pulling by that time. Um, mm. But, yeah, he sort of kept staying to his processes till, to the point where, you know, um, lucky he came off, but it was, uh, I guess, a little bit too late, I guess, in that sense. Speaking of wearing balls on the body, I mean, there was a great spell you bowled to Matthew Wade in the Adelaide Test match. I mean, in terms of things that I'd never want to do, it's facing you at nine o'clock in Adelaide with a pink ball. That's oh. been it, like he was just like letting the ball hit him yeah. and, and and then staring and then staring and like, so when you're bowling and a guy's just going, oh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let this ball hit me in the body. First of all, like why would you want to do that? Second mm. of all, why, isn't that extremely painful? Mm. I mean, like what were you thinking when you're bowling? Like, I'm just gonna hit him in the shoulder here mm. and don't praise him. Sure. Firstly, if it, was, if it was in Adelaide, if it was in Adelaide, I thought we would have said it was right, but it was actually in freaking Perth. And I was in Perth. The office. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, even better. Yeah. And, and, and on that wicket, which um, is known for quite a bit of pace and bounce and mm. sort of kicking up on the length, I thought it was pretty gutsy, uh, to be fair. And, um, yeah, he's a resilient character, isn't he? He just um, didn't want to let go. He didn't want to give his wicket up and keep wearing it. I couldn't believe it, to be fair. And sort of kept smiling at him, and I thought, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know what he's trying to do here, yeah. um, but he, yeah, he just he just kept going and kept going, and the more I sort of had him, the more he sort of wanted it, and I thought, oh, full credit to him, um, and yeah, he didn't want to get out to me, so I guess, uh, yeah, the plan worked, um, but yeah, I was sure as hell wouldn't really wanted to do that, because um, yeah, even though a lot of the quickest is still probably would hurt and take a couple of shots, but uh, it was quite nice sitting with him afterwards in the Sydney Test match, um, having a beer, and um, yeah, having a yarn and, and he was having a bit of a laugh about it and, and we sort of gave each other a bit of stick and uh, it was all good fun. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty fiery and, and fiery, feisty character he is. And, mm. Yeah, full credit to him. Did he have his shirt off while... Uh, yeah, we you ice, we were icing his bruises? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think he wanted to show him, mate. I think he's... <laughs> he <didn't want> to. <laughs> <laughs> full skins. <laughs> <laughs> That was just, that was just a really funny exchange because, uh, like, as youngsters, we're sort of similar age to Matt Wade, I guess, and we grew up with the folklore of Steve Waugh staring down Kurtley Ambrose and stuff on his way to two hundred. And I think Matt Wade was sort of trying to emulate that in his own way by like staring at you, but it was it was just a little bit different. Mm. And your face was perfect because it was just more bemused. He was mm. like, what, what, "What what are you what, doing? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you like this? It's the perfect way to bring down a toxic <laughs> male." <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, anything from you here, guys? Uh, Neil, thanks so much for joining us, mate, and enduring that. Uh, wishing you all the best uh, for the summer, if and when you guys uh, can get on and, uh, and and hopefully chat to more of your uh, Kiwi colleagues soon. Thank you very much, mate, and uh, hopefully you guys get our lockdown soon too and have a good time.